Hello everyone, I'm Mujtaba and welcome to another episode of A Sip of Chemistry. The concept of chemical bonds has fascinated scientists since the discovery of the electron in 1897. Over the years, numerous intelligent minds have proposed theories to describe this fundamental building block across various scientific disciplines, including chemistry, physics, biology, and engineering. In this journey, we encounter various theories from the simple approach of Lewis, who depicted bonds as lines between nuclei, to the complexities of quantum mechanical treatments aimed at unraveling the mysterious of chemical bonding. David Brown, an emeritus professor at McMaster University, is renowned for his lifelong pursuit of understanding bonds. His contributions to the scientific community include the development of bond valence theory, among other notable achievements. It was my pleasure to interview Professor David Brown and gain insights into his research on bonding in inorganic materials. Notably, he is the inventor of the crystallographic information files, a project that has been in use since 1970. Thank you for joining me and stay tuned for this exciting interview with Professor David Brown. Thank you so much, Professor, for agreeing doing this interview. I'm so excited about it, and uh, yeah, uh, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, um, you're very welcome. Yeah. Please tell us about your uh, education and uh, what did you do uh, in terms of research at the University of McMaster? Yes. Well, I was uh, my primary school teaching was when I was living in Montreal for that, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, the high school was in um, in England. I went to Felsted School. Uh, then, of course, I had to do military service for two years, after which I uh, enrolled as a, in a bachelor's program at King's College London. Um, they would only admit me into a general program. They didn't figure that I was capable of handling a, a full physics program. Mm -hmm. But after two years of that program, I did sufficiently well that they, uh, they allowed me to take the physics program. But the advantage of doing the general program was that I did get some chemistry mm -hmm. uh, in there, and um, and that had a quite a bearing on what I did subsequently. <clears throat> so uh, that was your uh, the background of you all in university. Uh, what you did in the university, you did uh, physics uh, in England, uh, then. Uh, for uh, your career, I mean, as, as a professor uh, at the university, you decided to come to McMaster. Uh, yeah, well, I, I, I had, to, I'd had to do a PhD, of course. And uh, for that, um, I went to the Royal Institution where the, uh, the director was uh, Sir Lawrence Bragg at the mm -hmm. time. And, um, uh, and, and there I, I got involved with uh, X-ray diffraction, uh, which was what Bragg had originally. He was the person who first did uh, uh, show the structure of sodium chloride using X-ray diffraction. Yeah. And, uh, but at that time, he had, his group were mostly working on uh, the structure of proteins, which was much, much more complicated. Um, I, I was assigned to um, a supervisor uh, who was more interested in, in uh, organic chemistry. Mm -hmm. And I had a project of uh, working out the structures of two copper complexes of, of uh, organic molecules. Um, the last year of my PhD, uh, I went to, uh, to um, <coughs> I spent in Zurich, uh, because my supervisor, Jack Dunnett, uh, had been appointed as, as a professor 
at uh, the ATH the, in, in Zurich, the mm -hmm. um, Federal in Institute of Technology. Okay. And, well, uh, and then, then of course, I looked. I was lo looking at the ads for postdoctoral fellows. Uh, at that point, I thought neutron diffraction might be uh, an interesting area to get into. It looked as if it had some potential for expansion. And it turned out that McMaster University was looking for a crystallographer to, uh, uh, to develop neutron diffraction in their newly minted uh, so nuclear reactor. Yeah, that was it. So, uh, so I came as a postdoctoral fellow and uh, most, well, my work has focused at that time on the neutron diffraction. Um, later, it went back to the X-ray diffraction because uh, that, that, that there are more problems you can look at in X-rays than you can with neutrons. During your uh, PhD uh, as a graduate student at that time, uh, what difficulties you faced uh, when you wanted to do your research? Uh, there was not uh, nice computers around, I guess. So uh, how, how, did, how did you manage to do all uh, your research uh, with the facilities that were available at that time? Well, the computers were just beginning to come, come into use at that point. So um, all the calculations we did were done by hand. Um, X-ray diffraction involves a Fourier transformation of the, 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 the strengths of the diffracted beams. Mm -hmm. uh, and if you do this transformation, you get a, a picture of what the molecule looks like. Um, but it's an uh, elaborate and time-consuming calculation. Um, typically, it took about a year to, to solve one crystal structure. Um, but there was a computer, a general purpose computer installed in London. And I did do some of my calculations on that. So that was uh, programming in machine language mm -hmm. uh, with a memory somewhere of, of something a little over 100 words in, uh, to work with. Um, but even that was a, a, a big uh, uh, advancement on doing the calculations uh, on, on mechanical adding machines. So that, uh, that was an... I think interesting experience yeah, at the time for you that uh, how, how it saved your time, how much it saved your time to do this calculation using that uh, mechanical computer. There were a number of tricks that, that were introduced into these calculations. Um, there were uh, what, the, what they called the beaver's lips and strips, which had all the uh, trigonometric functions uh, were uh, available on that. So that saved a lot of time. Mm -hmm. And by using symmetries, we, you could cut down the, the calculations uh, quite considerably in that way. So, but the uh, diffraction patterns were all measured on photographic films, and we had to estimate the intensities of each of the diffraction spots by eye. So uh, that, and that was uh, not a very pleasant Activity <laughs> demanded time and the uh, experienced eye. Yeah. Well, I, I would, I would, I would work on my films for the first hour of the day, and that was enough. So <laughs> every every day I do an hour of, of measuring these intensities. Yeah, I can imagine how hard it, it uh, yeah. was at the time. <laughs> so you uh, retired nineteen ninety six, I guess. Yeah. Uh, so what did you do? Uh, uh, in terms of research after your retirement, did it change your career or not? Oh, the, the retirement made made no difference to, to my life, um, yeah. except that I didn't have to give undergraduate lectures, so I had a little more time. But the uh, the research carried right on until the uh, uh, until the arrival of COVID in in, in, in twenty twenty. Mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> at that point, they closed the university down, so I had to move everything. Um, to my house, and uh, and and I've haven't I haven't gone back to the university since mm -hmm. then. I can the work I'm uh, well I'm not I'm I've given up now on on doing chemistry, but uh, I, I was able to 
write my last paper uh, from home. In 1959, there was a conference uh, at the International uh, Coordination Chemi Chemistry Meeting. I, I think that uh, at that point, uh, did you meet uh, Paulings at that conference and uh, how, how it actually shaped uh, the idea of working on but chemical bonding. Well, I, I, <clears throat> I went to the conference. I was still an, uh, um, a graduate student at the time. <clears throat> but I was quite entertained by Pauling. He, he gave uh, one of the lectures, and uh, it was delightful to see the way he, he spoke. He, he was a, a very good lecturer, uh, very easy to follow. But uh, he would describe chemical bonding by saying, well, we take you know a little bit of this d orbital here and we mix it in with with <laughs> some p orbital here and uh, and then what you get is is uh, sort of carried on like that it reminded me very much of of um, of a chef uh, talking about making up a dish you know put a little salt <laughs> here and a bit of pepper and then you know stir everything up well yeah um, but in fact that didn't uh, it didn't directly affect my Career. It was only quite a bit later, uh, maybe ten years later, that I realized that um, that Pauling had done the groundwork in the area that I wanted to look at, and that was in a paper in 1929 before I was born. <coughs> um, and uh, the Pauling uh, laid out the some of the the, the basic rules about the structures of inorganic compounds in that paper. <coughs> um, uh, I hadn't, I wasn't really aware of that paper, but Pauling having published that paper and, and that was the beginning of his, of his career, um, he then got interested in, in quantum mechanics and, and so he left the area without following up mm -hmm. and um, a lot of people subsequently tried to improve on Pauling's ideas but they were, didn't do a very good job and I got very worried when I found myself um, following in Pauling's footsteps wondering whether I was going to be one of these people who really got lost and pushed the, the subject further than it was capable of going. But in the event, uh, that didn't happen. So excellent. But uh, you did a great job. To, uh, you followed his uh, footsteps and you developed uh, bond valence. Yeah, bond valence theory. Yeah. That, uh, that's an amazing thing. So chemical bonds have been your concern uh, since you did your graduate study. Yes. Uh, yes. So then you try to understand what's really a chemical bond. Mm -hmm. So would you uh, walk us through the, this concept, uh, this basic concept, but uh, very important for chemists, biologists, physicists. Would you walk us through this concept and uh, tell us uh, maybe a brief history of uh, this, uh, the, the bond, chemical bond, since the discovery of uh, electron? Uh, what happened uh, during a century, and eventually you developed uh, a theory. Would you walk us through this journey? Yeah. The, um, yes, the chemical bond was proposed in, around 1860 <coughs> as a way of explaining organic, the, the molecules of organic chemistry that were being uh, found, and, and it, it produced um, an explanation which was very powerful. It, it made the assumption that um, all elements consisted of identical atoms, or each element consisted of identical atoms, and that these atoms were arranged in such a way that they, uh, they formed bonds with their neighbors. Mm -hmm. um, and in organic chemistry, uh, all the bonds were essentially equivalent. Uh, except you could have two bonds between the same two car mm -hmm. carbon atoms or even three bonds. Um, but otherwise, they were all uh, equivalent. 
um, when people discovered, started to discover how um, inorganic compounds were, uh, were arranged, the atoms there, those rules didn't apply anymore. And, uh, and people were getting, trying out all kinds of ways of trying to understand chemical bonding. The, the concept of atoms and, and, the, and bonds was very firmly there. And eventually, when uh, quantum mechanics developed sufficiently, everybody around 1930, everybody thought that the, the, the secret to the to the atom and the bond would be found in quantum mechanics. But they certainly found how um, how atoms stick together to form molecules. Uh, but one of the things that they didn't discover in quantum mechanics was a chemical bond. They didn't even really discover the atom. Once the atoms form a molecule, they all kind of merge in together. So the idea of atoms and bonds were still talked about, but nobody could actually manage to define what a bond was. So you have to go back to the, uh, the original picture of um, some sort of materials consisting of atoms that have these bond links to their neighbors. Mm -hmm. Now, the, the trick is that all these bonds are not equal. Some of them are stronger than other ones. And if you take the valence of an atom, that's a measure of the strength of the bonds that it forms, uh, that valence can be is distributed among the various bonds that it forms, so that if there are four bonds around, as in the sulfur atom in, in the sulfate ion, then the valence of six of the sulfur gets distributed among the four bonds, so each of the bonds is worth one and a half mm -hmm. valence units. If you now look at sodium, this has only one, a valence of one, um, but it typically forms six bonds. So the bonds that sodium forms are um, all about one sixth of a valence unit. And if you allow the valence the, the bonds to have different valences, then uh, you can cover not only or, uh, organic chemistry, but inorganic chemistry as well. Interesting. Um, now, what is, a, what is a bond? Well, nobody can actually measure a bond as such or to take a picture of a bond. It's, a, it's one of those ideas that we create because it helps us to link together other things that we can measure. Mm -hmm. So we can measure the length of a bond because it's the distance between the two atoms that are bonded, and that we can measure. <coughs> And we also can make the assumption that the atom we, whose valence we know will distribute that valence among the bonds that it forms. And if you do that, you discover that there is a relationship between the length of the bond and the valence of the bond. Um, there's the, the longer the bond gets, the, the smaller the, the valence becomes. And that's a very robust relationship. So there are other um, simple rules that you can make with these uh, valences. Um, each uh, atom forms an equal number, or, you know, uses an equal amount of valence to form a particular bond. So this means that um, if you're looking for things that will bond to sodium, yeah, you want to look for atoms uh, that also form bonds with valences of around one sixth. Mm -hmm. um, if you take oxygen, which typically is four, forms four bonds and has a valence of two, oxygen forms bonds then with, uh, typically forms bonds with valences of about a half. And that's rather too large to form a nice bond with sodium. So sodium oxide isn't a very stable material. But if you go to magnesium, which has a valence of two, 
and also forms around six bonds. Um, its typical bond uh, valence will be around 0.33. Now, this is getting closer to the valence of oxygen of 0.5. Mm -hmm. So magnesium does form bonds with, with oxygen. Um, so when you put all these things together, um, uh, you, you, can create, you can create the networks of, of at bonded atoms. Uh, that represents particular compounds. And you can use these simple rules for calculating exactly what valence you would expect the bond to have. And then you can compare that with the length of the bond that you measure. And so you've got confirmation that this theory does give correct predictions. Now, this typical valence that I've been talking about, 1.5 for sulfur, 0.5 for oxygen, uh, and um, and one, one six for sodium. This uh, we call the bonding strength of the atom, and that's the one property that is the key to understanding the valence theory. And it's the one property that all the chemists seem to have overlooked entirely. Uh, they've always been looking at other other properties of atoms. It turns out also that the, this bonding strength uh, is directly proportional to the electronegativity. So you also get the electronegativity values out of that one parameter. Mm -hmm. And from that, and, uh, and the, the only things you really need to reconstruct any of these compounds is the valence of the atom the bonding strength of the atom, and a little bit of knowledge about how many electrons there are in the valence shell. And uh, with that, you can, you can uh, create, or you, you can uh, map structures, predict bond lengths, um, predict which compounds are going to be stable, which ones will not be stable, how compounds will react, what their chemical properties are, and what their structures are. So it's a very powerful theory. It's very simple. And it has absolutely nothing to do with quantum mechanics. Um, uh, now, the fact that it has nothing to do with quantum mechanics means that it's not as powerful as quantum mechanics, mm -hmm. which can, but, but it's much simpler. And it can be understood by people in, in high school uh, so it's an excellent model uh, for introducing chemical bonding and structure. Um, but it's also a powerful enough one that you can, uh, that, that uh, experienced chemists can use to quickly think through uh, what the properties of a particular compound might be without having to revert to quantum mechanics. Yeah, quite simple, but very instrumental. Very powerful, yeah. That's that's an interesting theory. If a graduate student and an undergraduate student ask you uh, this question, that what's a chemical <coughs> bond? How you describe it to them? Well, to the undergraduate, to, to the um, to, to the the school, the school student, yeah, high school student, I would say that all all the materials that you see around you can be simply described as con composed of atoms and that these atoms are linked to their neighbors by chemical bonds which form uh, attachments so these, 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 these atoms stick together so you can describe the chemical molecules you can describe crystals um, uh, as, by, as uh, an array of atoms that are all linked together into a network by these bonds. And now that's a picture of an atom, uh, of a picture of how atoms stick together. It's, it's not, a, not a necessarily a good picture of, of, of what's going on in the physics, yeah. but it's a very simple picture. Now to the undergraduate, I would say, um, 
uh, that uh, quantum mechanics uh, will give you a lot of information about the mechanism by which atoms hold together. Um, the calculations are very complex and they don't provide much intuitive information. Um, and uh, more importantly, you can't do the calculations <coughs> until you know the positions of all, of all the nuclei. So you have to know the structure of the compound before you can do the quantum calculations. Uh, in, the, uh, in the valence theory, uh, you don't need to know where the atoms are. All you need to know is which other atoms they were bonded to. Um, so it's much more flexible and it's incredibly simple. Uh, the, the mathematics is at the, at the other extreme from quantum mechanics. Can we see the chemical bonds? Uh, so. No, a, a chemical bond is not something that you can see. Um, it, it's a, it's a way of de describing atoms. The things that you can see are the nuclei and with the positions of the nuclei. And if you, in fact, use neutron diffraction rather than X-ray diffraction, what you're looking at are the positions of the nuclei. Um, you can also see how the negative charge that surrounds the nuclei mm -hmm. Uh, is distributed throughout the compound. Um, uh, but what you can't see is any sign of, of a line between two nuclei that would represent the bond. Please tell us about the inorganic uh, crystal structure database and crystallographic information file projects uh, you've been actively involved in establishing these two uh, databases and uh, uh, please tell us about it. Yeah, yeah. Well, okay, the, the, um, the, the first 10 years that I spent at McMaster were really exploratory. I had no idea really what I, where I was going. Um, by hindsight, I can see I was interested in all the different kinds of structures that, that uh, I was um, uh, measuring. Um, these were mostly compounds that were provided by my colleagues in the chemistry department, particularly uh, Ron Gillespie. And, they was, and some of these were quite interesting structures um, from the chemical point of view, the way the, the constraints of the chemistry and the constraints of the uh, positions of the geometry, the positioning of atoms, uh, affected each other. Um, but uh, it was when we, when, when I met um, uh, Bob Shannon, who came to join us for a year, um, I met him on the second day of his stay at lunchtime. And uh, by, by that evening, I knew that we had hit on something that was particularly interesting. He reintroduced me to um, Pauling's uh, paper. And uh, what we really needed to do at this point was to um, look at as many crystal structures as we could possibly find and, and, and look for the patterns, uh, how the, uh, the bond lengths and, and the, the bond valences uh, correlated with each other. Mm -hmm. And to do this, um, this meant going to the library, um, finding a, a paper with a description of a crystal structure, copying down all the coordinates of, of the atoms, coming back to the computer, um, punching up all these coordinates on, on the punch cards, mm -hmm. which then fed into the computer. And, um, and we could then recalculate all the distances to make sure we had all of the distances that we needed. And we had to do that for, I don't know, four or 500 different compounds. Uh, and Bob Shannon did most of that work. It was a very noble work and com completely uh, uninteresting in itself. 
So when he left, he left me four or five large boxes of, of punch cards. And all that effort that he put into it was really quite useless because I couldn't find any particular compound out in these four boxes. The, the, the cards, two of them, they were, they, were, they were all together by compound, but it was, it was difficult to find um, which cards belonged to which compound. And it occurred to me that, um, that if we had a database with all this information already coded in, in, so that it could be read straight into a computer, um, this would uh, greatly simplify matters. And um, in my second sabbatical year, I went to Cambridge, to the Cambridge Data Center, and worked with them for a year. They were already producing a database of organic compounds. Um, and we were developing, oh, we, we wanted to, de to develop a database for inorganic compounds. The, the, the kinds of information that were available were, are, are different for these two. So it made sense to have two different databases. But um, what then becomes apparent is that um, all the different structure, all the different programs that we had for calculating bond lengths uh, and, and other crystallographic properties um, all had their own particular ways of entering the, the information. And what one really needed was a standard kind of information so that everybody's programs could read the same information off a, mm -hmm. off a punch cards or, or, or a magnetic tape. Um, so uh, it would have been uh, um, around uh, 1975 uh, that I proposed that the International Union of Crystallography create a, um, a, a standard uh, format for crystallographic information. So people could move the uh, information about a particular compound from, from one computer to another computer and ultimately could put it into a database from which other people could retrieve this information. So uh, in the first instance, this meant setting up a, um, a, a committee to establish a, uh, a, a, a file structure, a standard file structure. Mm -hmm. uh, in the event, the, the uh, proposal that I made uh, was not adopted, a different one was adopted, which was a much more powerful one. Um, and, but then it became necessary, of course, to have dictionaries so that everybody knew what each of these numbers were. Some, sometimes the, the definitions were ambiguous. Uh, the, there was one particular property which defi was defined in two different ways, and the authors of papers didn't say which way they were defining it. And of course, yeah. then the, the information is useless. So I got very much involved in in uh, developing the, the dictionaries that defined uh, what all these terms were that were, were in this standard file structure were called the, uh, the went by the initials of CIF. Um, but at the same time, uh, working uh, with the people in Germany, um, we developed the uh, inorganic uh, structural database. Mm -hmm crystallographic database. And um, I collaborated on that for a while, that the German government financed that, and eventually it was taken over fully by the, uh, uh, by the Germans. So that was my involvement in, in, uh, in establishing standards for the reporting of crystal structures. Uh, thank you so much for doing that, because it, it, it made the life easier for <laughs> my generation, for uh, the uh, other researchers, uh, actually to uh, use this uh, database. Yeah. Uh, would you walk us through the development of the characterization techniques uh, used for 
uh, detecting the chemical bonds uh, in the past few years? Well, the, um, the, the, the chemical bond, is, as I said, is, 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 li is a figment of our own imagination. Mm -hmm. So it, it is what, what you define it to be. And uh, different people can define chemical bonds in different ways. Yeah. Uh, in, the, in the work that I was doing, uh, we looked for, uh, for the neighboring atoms. Well, depending on whether we were looking at a, a structure that had been already uh, d d measured, we knew where the atoms were, so we could see who the, what the neighboring atoms was, were. And, um, uh, and essentially, you just connect all the neighboring atoms. However, um, there are some neighboring atoms that are not bonded to each other. For instance, in the, in the sulfate group where you have sulfur in the middle and four oxygen atoms around, the, around it, uh, the sulfur is bonded to the oxygen, but the oxygen atoms are not bonded to each other. Um, so uh, you have to eliminate those. And in cases like sodium, um, where the bonds gradually get longer and longer, you have to have a cutoff at some point. Mm -hmm. um, but since, you, since we know uh, that the longer bonds are going to be the weaker ones, the point at which we cut off doesn't become very important um, uh, because the, the bonds are so weak that they really don't make much of a contribution. Yeah. What's the difference between a, a physicist and a Chemist perspective to a bond. Uh, well, essentially, a physicist is, is happiest if he has one particle in his universe. Uh, if he, that's rather uninteresting. Uh, two particles is much more interesting, but three particles is is uh, almost too complicated. Um, so, the physicist's world is always the simplest that he can possibly make it. Mm. Um, the chemist, on the other hand, is interested in real materials, and these are inevitably much more complex than, than physicists are comfortable with. Um, so the bond is essentially a chemical concept. Uh, the, the physicists uh, sort of listen to the chemists talking about bonds, but they're somewhat bemused by uh, by this concept, because it doesn't it doesn't appear in chemistry, in physics at all, and uh, the physicists don't know how to how, how to handle the idea of a bond. So let's move to beyond the lab. Uh, mm -hmm. What are your hobbies? What do you do at your spare time? Uh, my my hobbies are mostly related around history in one form or another. Um, I've uh, written a couple of family histories. And I'm also interested in, in um, old coins, numismatics. Um, these, are, uh, these were introduced around 500 BC, and um, they're always produced in relatively large numbers. So mm -hmm. it's, it's easy enough to, um, I mean, it's still possible to, to, to buy these coins from at a, at a reasonable price, even going back thousands of years. Um, so uh, the, the, the coins are fascinating. They, of course, they give information about their, their own times. They, they have artistic merits very often. Um, uh, and, and, uh, and it's just nice to, to be able to handle these artifacts yeah. and, and to to, to sort of live the history that they uh, uh, that they tell. Um, so those are my main uh, uh, main hobbies. I also have a grandfather clock that that I have to keep arrange to keep that the time properly. It's it's, it's always a challenge. It, it was it was it was built around the time that Newton died. In the early 18th century, uh, 18th century. And, and it, but it, it keeps the time generally within about 10 seconds over the course of a week. That's interesting. That's amazing. Yeah. Uh, 
who is your favorite scientist within the past few centuries? That's an interesting question. Um, it's, um, it's Joseph Priestley, uh, r rather unexpected, perhaps. Um, Priestley has always been one of my heroes. Uh, he's remembered for his uh, campaigning for the phlogiston theory, uh, which was shot down um, in, 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 in the, around 1800. Um, it, it, uh, it was a theory that, uh, of, of chemical reactions uh, that, that made sense when it was originally proposed in the early 18th century. Mm -hmm. But as more information became available, um, it, it was clear that it, 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 was not, uh, it was not a profitable way to, to proceed. Um, by hindsight, at, the, at this distance, we can see that phlogiston, you know, was, was sort of was representing the, the, the electron, uh, the, the, the role of the electron in chemical bonding. Yeah. Um, but Priestley uh, continued to, to push his theory even when everybody else had, had, uh, had gone way beyond that. But Priestley was an interesting person. He was a political activist, and he was also a theologian. And, uh, and uh, I, I'm not quite sure. I guess it's just his style somehow rather appealed to me. But I discovered in doing my family history that my great, 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 great uncle was a, a, a disciple of Priestley. Uh, he, uh, he belonged to Priestley's church. And uh, and uh, very much favored his, uh, his uh, Unitarian theology, uh, Priestley's theology as a Unitarian, mm -hmm. and he eventually um, edited and published all of Priestley's works, uh, uh, combined works. So that family connection was interesting as well. Um, yeah, that's, uh, you learn later on, yeah, that there is a family connection. No, yeah, it's, okay, it's, that's it's, interesting. It's, 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 it's interesting to have yeah. that connection. Do you have any regrets in your life? Oh, in regrets. In your life? Yeah, I think, uh, I think my main regret is that, um, uh, that I was born a risk of us. Uh, if, if you're really going to get anywhere in, in, in science, if you're going to win a Nobel Prize, you have to take risks, or you have to be ready to take risks. Mm. And uh, and I just shy away from risks. And and my my philosophy is that if the ideas I come up with work, they will sell themselves. Um, but they can't rely on me to uh, to sell them. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, is there any other thing that you would like to? Talk about I didn't ask. I don't think so. Okay, thank yeah. you so much. Thank you for yeah. your time and uh, for hosting me at your house. And uh, yeah, you're, you're very welcome. Yeah.